a rather solemn parade to mark 70 years of a country's independence. A religious ceremony at Myanmar's most sacred Buddhist shrine and a few words from the vice president. But state councillor and de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi was absent in both ceremonies. Suu Kyi took power in 2016, promising to implement sweeping reforms and revive the economy. Decades of military rule left it battered, with high inflation, ballooning debt and years of budget deficit. Critics say Suu Kyi hasn't made significant progress with her plans, but her supporters say it's too early to judge. She's also been facing increasing international criticism over the Rohingya crisis, which could dampen investor sentiment and tourism. Myanmar is accused of carrying out ethnic cleansing in a state that also has high economic stakes. Rakhine is home to a strategically located port that boasts a favourable route in the Bay of Bengal. And China's reportedly looking to own up to 85% of it. The port is on Ramri Island and is part of a $10 billion special economic zone the Myanmar government is planning to build. The state is also a key part of China's One Belt, One Road initiative. Both countries have agreed to build oil and gas pipelines from Kyakpyu to southwestern China. And despite recent condemnation from the international community, Myanmar is keeping up efforts to attract foreign investment. In December, the government signed a new law which will loosen investment regulations. It comes into force in August and will allow foreign investors to hold up to 35% of local companies. The Yangon Stock Exchange is introducing an online trading system to boost the bourse's trading value. It began operations in March 2016, and on Thursday, its fifth publicly listed company started trading. While the government made no mention of the Rohingya crisis on Thursday, it pledged to improve on peace and national unity. To build national reconciliation and peace, we hope and try to create a democratic country where all the ethnic groups have freedom, justice, equal rights and the chance to shape their own destiny. Critics hope that includes the Rohingya, many of whom are now refugees. But many fear Myanmar now has too much money on the line for them to ever return. Laila Humaira, TRT World. For more on this, let's bring in Saskia Sassen. She's a professor of sociology at Columbia University and author of the book Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy. She's written extensively about Myanmar and joins us now from London. Saskia, great to have you on Money Talks once again. Um, as state councillor, how much say does Aung San Suu Kyi have over the running of the economy? Well, strictly speaking, she really has almost none. It must be said, a country like Myanmar and most countries in the world have two economies. One is the economy of small farmers, you know, small, very small operations. She might have some role to play in there, at least initially when she first came, all the Buddhists who supported her. But when it comes to the larger corporate economy, it's the, the military control that. And that is sort of written into for quite a while it has been written into, I don't know if you can call it a constitution, but a, a, a key document. So there is quite a bit of clarity on that matter, that she does not really play a role in the big corporate economy. It's China and the military. Ah, that's quite interesting. So is this part, is, does this go to the root of this problem then? That it is essentially the military that is controlling the economy and that Myanmar is still a long way off from being a transparent uh, and efficient market that uh, people can invest in and one that will benefit ordinary people. Well, I'm sure that there is a shadow effect also from that corporate economy, which means that a kind of a modest middle class can emerge in the cities, more so than in rural areas, I would say. And, you know, there always are sort of uh, ways in which a small firm can enter the picture and become a bigger firm. But what is happening right now, the most extreme moment clearly that Myanmar has been living, is this question of the big port in Rakhine State, 7.2 billion port and the big in development zone, 
and there the military are in control. And so while the question of the expulsion of, uh, of the Rohingya, because they are Muslims supposedly, that is the great humanitarian crisis of our epoch, I would say. But I do think that in my reading, and I've been working on this, the military knew exactly what they were doing and used the question of religion to expel so many of these Rohingyas. It's an extraordinary expulsion. Right. So, it's I mean, we've been... Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, we've been talking about this, uh, this concept uh, a couple of times this week uh, in the context of China and Cuba, for example, um, where their economies are also controlled by uh, the military. Um, is Myanmar setting itself up for the same kinds of problems that we see in some of these other countries that, where the military has such uh, a powerful role over the economy? I think that it is a different story, partly because Cuba was a very Cuban operation. Of course, the Russians helped, you know, and there were a few people who helped, but, and Russia certainly played a, a critical role a while ago. I think in Myanmar, it's, I think it's a different story. And two histories come together. One is this anti-Rohingya sentiment that has been happening, you know, for a very, very long time. It takes a very different turn in 2012 when we see the first time of a kind of economic project beginning to hang in there. And it, I think at that point, China was, it was the pipelines, it was, you know, it was not the big port that is now on the agenda of their, you know, their one, one road, one belt uh, project. But so I, I see the case of the Rohingya differently and the, and the question of the Myanmar economy also as being different from the Cuban because of this extraordinarily active, strong, and one might say, you know, if you're a businessman, generous uh, role of, the, of, of China. Mm. And that they are investing a vast amount of money. So there is a kind of ironic little twist in there. Now, in the meantime, they have really managed to capture, and that means destroy, a third of the huge Myanmar forest, you know, for wood. It's basically about... Right. Uh, you know, timber. Right. Okay. So um, they, the, the, the Chinese have not lost. Right. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Saskia Sassen, uh, thank you so much for your analysis there. Saskia Sassen, professor at Columbia University.